all chemical reactions involve energy changes. We recognise the evidence of this when we observe a temperature change accompanying a reaction, or light or sound being produced. In this topic we'll be looking at why energy changes accompany reactions, and how we can measure or calculate the size of these energy changes. The proper name for the chemical energy that substances have is enthalpy. This form of energy originates with the chemical bonds that hold the substance together. Like any form of energy, enthalpy has units of joules, although a joule is a pretty small amount of energy and it's more usual to discuss energies in kilojoules. If you look at the labelling on foods, you may well see the energy content of the food, as shown here for an orange drink. The older units of energy, calories, still persist. And you should be aware that calories and joules are both measures of the same thing, the chemical energy inside the food. We know by observation that many reactions are exothermic. They release heat energy, and we would see a temperature increase during the reaction if we measured the temperature. This heat energy has to come from somewhere. In an exothermic reaction, the chemical energy, or enthalpy, is being transformed into heat energy, so that at the end of the reaction, the products have less enthalpy and more heat energy. Reactions that do this would include oxidations, such as burning fuels, and neutralizations. The thermal imaging picture here shows that people are warmer than their surroundings. This is because when our bodies use food for respiration, this is an exothermic reaction and heat is generated. The graph here shows how the temperature increases during an exothermic reaction. The temperature increases as the reaction progresses until one of the reactants is used up. Then the reaction finishes and the temperature is at its maximum. After that, with no more heat being produced, the reaction mixture slowly cools back down to the temperature of the surroundings. Exothermic reactions are widely used in everyday life. For example, whenever we use fuel to generate heat. Hand warmers are another good example and come in rechargeable and disposable types. You can also get food in self-heating cans, which is useful for outdoor activities such as hiking when it might be difficult to cook. Inside the can, an exothermic reaction is used to heat the compartment where the food is, bringing it up to the right temperature to eat. Endothermic reactions are rather less common. We can recognise an endothermic reaction in one of two ways. Either when the reaction happens, the temperature decreases, or the reaction doesn't go unless we keep on providing heat energy. Thermal decompositions such as cracking of long-chain alkanes or turning calcium carbonate into calcium oxide and water only work at high temperatures when sufficient heat energy is being supplied to drive the reaction along. Photosynthesis is another example of an endothermic reaction. It doesn't work unless light energy is supplied. In terms of energy changes, during an endothermic reaction, the energy that is being supplied is being transformed into chemical energy, or enthalpy, so that at the end of the reaction, the products have more enthalpy. The graph here shows how the temperature would change during an endothermic reaction at room temperature. The temperature decreases as the reaction progresses, until one of the reactants is used up. Then the reaction finishes, and the temperature is at its minimum. After that, the reaction mixture slowly warms up back to the temperature of the surroundings. We encounter endothermic reactions of this kind in the cold packs that are used to treat sport injuries, for example. If we want to understand what makes a reaction exothermic or endothermic, we need to think about the reaction in terms of bonds breaking and bonds being made. During any reaction, bonds in the reactants have to be broken, and this requires energy to be supplied. The atoms are then able to form new bonds to create the products, and bond making releases energy. We'll use the reaction between hydrogen and oxygen to make water as an example. It helps if we first rewrite the equation so that we can see all the bonds between the atoms. Firstly, we have to break the bonds between the hydrogen atoms and the double bond between the oxygen atoms. The energy required to do this is the activation energy for the reaction, which you may remember from collision theory when we looked at rates of reaction. To find out how much energy is actually needed to do this, we use a table of average bond energies. 
This lists the energy required to break different types of bond. We can see that each of the two hydrogen to hydrogen bonds requires 436 kilojoules per mole and the oxygen to oxygen double bond requires 496 kilojoules per mole so that in total the activation energy for our reaction is 1368 kilojoules per mole. Now we need to consider the energy that will be released when the bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygen atoms are made to form the two water molecules. We make four oxygen to hydrogen bonds and we can see from our table of average bond energies that this will release four times 463 which is 1858 kilojoules per mole. In summary we've taken energy in to break the bonds in the reactants and we have released energy when the bonds in the products are formed. The difference between these two amounts of energy is what makes our reaction endothermic or exothermic overall. When we want to work out whether a reaction is endothermic or exothermic and how much energy will be taken in or released, we need firstly to list the bonds that need to be broken and add up their average bond energies. Then we need to list the bonds that will be made and add up their average bond energies. The difference between these is called the molar enthalpy change and is given the symbol delta H. This is the overall change in chemical energy when the reaction takes place. For our reaction, we can see that delta H is equal to 1,368 minus 1,858, which is minus 490 kilojoules per mole. Less energy was taken in than was given out. So overall, this is an exothermic reaction. This is consistent with delta H being negative. The amount of chemical energy, that is the enthalpy, has decreased because some of it has been transformed into heat energy. We can explain this in terms of bonds broken and made. In an exothermic reaction we find that delta H is always negative because less energy is needed to break the bonds in the reactants than the amount of energy that's released when the bonds in the products are formed. Conversely, for an endothermic reaction delta H is always positive because more energy is needed to break the bonds in the reactants than the energy that's released when the bonds in the products are formed. We can visualise exothermic reactions using an energy level diagram, which might also be called an enthalpy profile diagram. The y-axis is an enthalpy axis showing the amount of chemical energy. We can show the level of energy in our reactants and label this with their formulae. We then have to put in energy to break the bonds in the reactants, which we can label as the activation energy for the reaction. Then we release energy as we form the bonds in the products. For an exothermic reaction, this is more than the energy we put in. This is the level of enthalpy in our products, and we should label this with the formulae of the products. Finally, we label the overall energy change between the two levels, which is delta H. We can draw a very similar energy level diagram for an endothermic reaction. The only differences will be that the amount of energy we put in will be larger than the energy released when the bonds and the products are formed, and so delta H for the reaction will be positive. The effect of a catalyst on a reaction can also be shown using an energy level diagram. Remember that a catalyst works by lowering the activation energy, so it takes less energy to break the bonds in the reactants. Less energy will be released when the bonds in the products are made, however, so the overall energy change, delta H, remains exactly the same regardless of whether a catalyst is used. While it's very useful to be able to calculate the molar enthalpy change for a reaction, delta H, it's necessary to be able to measure it experimentally too. The technique is called calorimetry and is typically used to measure the energy content of fuels or foods. The basic idea is that the release of energy in the reaction results in an increase in temperature and this can be measured. We can relate the temperature change to the amount of energy needed to make this happen because it is known that it takes 4.2 joules of energy to increase the temperature of one gram of water by one degree C.
the kind of simple calorimeter shown here is not accurate, but could be used to compare the amount of energy released by different fuels or foods. The main sources of error are that not all of the heat energy produced in the reaction ends up heating the water. Heat is lost around the sides of the apparatus. Additionally, we get incomplete combustion taking place, so the reaction doesn't produce all of the heat energy that it should. More accurate calorimetry can be done using a sealed calorimeter called a bomb calorimeter, where the sample is burnt in an oxygen atmosphere to help complete combustion, and the reaction is completely surrounded by the water that's being heated up, so that all of the heat energy produced has to be transferred to the water. This gives a much more accurate set of results. Firstly, we work out how much energy the water must have gained to raise its temperature by the measured amount. We use the equation Q equals mc delta T, where Q is the amount of energy in joules, m is the mass of water that got heated by the reaction, and delta T is the change in temperature. C is a constant called the specific heat capacity, which is usually given the value of 4.2 joules per gram per degree C. For example, if we had a calorimeter containing 100 grams of water, and as a result of the reaction its temperature increased by 25 degrees C, then we can work out that the amount of energy transferred to the water equals 100 times 4.2 times 25, which is 10,500 joules, or 10.5 kilojoules. If we ignore the sources of error in the experiment, we can say that those 10.5 kilojoules of energy had to come from the reaction taking place. Since we burnt 2 grams of fuel, we could work out that the energy released was 5.25 kilojoules per gram of fuel, and we could compare this to the energy released by different fuels. A better comparison would be to work out how much energy is released per mole of fuel. This is the molar enthalpy change, delta H, that we've previously seen how to calculate using average bond energies. To work out the molar enthalpy change, we need to divide the energy change, Q, by the number of moles that reacted. We also need to change the sign, because an increase in temperature in an exothermic reaction corresponds to a negative value of delta H. If you know the mass of fuel that reacted, it isn't too difficult to convert that to moles of fuel by dividing by the relative formula mass. Here's a typical question comparing butane to ethanol. A sample of each has been burnt and the corresponding temperature rise measured along with the mass of fuel that was burnt. The mass of water in the calorimeter was kept constant at 250 grams in this experiment as a control variable and the starting temperature of the water was the same, 10 degrees C in each experiment. We want to use the results to decide which fuel produces more energy per mole of fuel. In other words, which fuel has the higher molar enthalpy change when it's burnt. Firstly, when the ethanol was burnt, we can work out that the joules of energy released, Q equals mc delta T, come out at 18,900 joules, or 18.9 kilojoules. The moles of ethanol burnt is given by mass, 0.5 grams, divided by the relative formula mass of ethanol, which is 46, giving 0 0.01087 moles. Now we can work out delta H, which is minus 18.9 divided by 0 0.01087, which is equal to minus 1739 kilojoules per mole. If we repeat these calculations for butane, we see that 31.5 kilojoules were released when the butane was burnt, and that we burnt 0 0.01379 moles of butane, so the molar enthalpy change is minus 2,284 kilojoules per mole, so that we can conclude that butane releases more energy per mole when burnt as a fuel compared to ethanol. The use of calorimetry is not limited to exothermic reactions when fuels and foods are burnt. We can measure the temperature change when many different reactions take place. So long as we know the mass of the reactants and the specific heat capacity, which for solutions will still be approximately 4.2 joules per gram per degree C, then we can work out Q, the energy released or taken in during the reaction.
If we know the number of moles that reacted, we can then calculate the molar enthalpy change, delta H, for reactions such as neutralization or displacements.